Welcome to the very first Middle East show. I am here to tell you 100% that this show is for you. And if there has been one thing in my life that has been a blessing, it is my capacity to say what so many people feel. Ultimately, my success or failure will be defined by what many of you feel and how well I can express that. And on that note, let's talk about our televisions. Have you ever felt like you wanted to throw the television out the window? Have you wanted to scream back at the nonsense that's being broadcast on the television? Well, if you have indeed, this station is for you. We also need to get into redefining language, in particular, words like terrorism. Now, for me, I've noticed that my birth nation, Britain and Israel in particular, form what I consider to be an axis of evil. And for them to be talking about other nations being terrorists is simply outrageous, totally outrageous. In fact, state-sponsored terrorism knows no better friend than my birth nation of the United States. And we need to talk about terrorism not in terms of simply what it is that other people are doing, but what, in fact, we pay for with our taxes. Now, I also want to help us talk about some issues that really have been so misrepresented, and historically so, and intentionally so, Palestine being one of them. Now, of course, there's no part of the Middle East that is more profoundly impactful on the world than Palestine. And ultimately, ultimately, Palestine has been portrayed in a way that is anything but the truth. And ultimately, we are going to help redefine our understanding of Palestine. 9-11. 9-11 is the be-all, end-all of false flag operations, and ultimately, 9-11 is the event that caused the manipulation of the world to such a degree that ultimately the Middle East has been set alight. Invasions, occupations, torture, drone strikes, never-ending war, the war on terror, the biggest farce of all, all on the pretext of 9-11. Now, we're going to discuss that in depth in one of the first programs that we have that really is going to discuss this is coming up in the next week or two and I can assure you it is as powerful as powerful gets. There's something I want to talk about Syria. Syria is incredible. What we've seen in Syria recently is absolutely amazing. I've never seen it before. Ever since uh, I was born I've never noticed anything even remotely like it. For years and years Syria and Iran have been targets. For many years the powers that be have been attempting to foster a war with Iran. There's been so many lies. The repeated lie, Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, was consistently quoted as saying that he called for wiping Israel off the map. This is an insult and a lie to all of us who are paying attention. The truth of the matter is that Israel, from the very beginning, literally wiped hundreds of Palestinian villages off the map, so it is beyond hypocrisy that we would hear Israeli officials talk about a misquoted president of Iran calling for wiping Israel off the map. It's a lie, and it's been repeated by all the prostitutes of propaganda over and over and over again. And these lies were basically told to us to justify what was ultimately an agenda to carry out a war with Iran. Now, that war threatens the entire world because it's hardly possible for Russia and China to sit by while yet another nation, which carries very important energy reserves in oil and gas, be invaded and occupied or otherwise destroyed. These people who are in positions of power have been attempting to manipulate us into a third world war and they have incessantly pumped out propaganda in order to try and justify this psychopath's dream of a world war, which by the way they need because more and more people are waking up and the only way you can control people is to divide them. So our agents of terrorism, the CIA, Mossad, MI6 and whatnot, have fostered one false flag after, after another in order to pit people against the, uh, each other. And very importantly, we can see the Shia Sunni division, which although there is some organic elements to this, we cannot mistake the fact that this uh, false division amongst Muslims has been fostered by agents of our governments over and over again, all with an agenda of having a war with Iran. Now, the way to get to Iran was going to be through Syria. Syria and Iran, of course, have a mutual defense pact. And ultimately, if we could get into Syria, it would force Iran, out of honor and integrity, to help defend its uh, common enemy. Now, keep in mind, NATO has an agreement amongst the northern nations of Europe and the United States to attack uh, if any nation within the NATO alliance is attacked. So this is basically the same kind of deal between Iran and Syria as NATO has amongst European states. Ultimately, however, in the case of Syria, the powers that be have tried to manipulate us into a third world war, into an, uh, an attack on Syria, and they failed. The UK Parliament, which is nothing more than a bunch of puppets and prostitutes as well, 
voted down uh, what was clearly an agenda that had the most powerful interest in the world. They voted it down. This is historic. It did not take protests. It simply took us not believing it. We did not give our compliance and they could not carry this out. The U.S. Congress, which is the most sycophantic, treasonous institution on the planet, was not able to even vote on this. And I'm telling you the reason why is because we as people are waking up and we're no longer believing the lies. I'm going to also make clear from the very beginning what my motivations are. Whether people believe it or not, the truth of the matter is that I consider every single human being on this planet to be a brother and sister. And even though many of my brothers and sisters are acting like complete psychopaths, those brothers and sisters, they need to understand very well that they are their own worst enemy because as people wake up, they will not tolerate the insanity of what they've been, what they've been involved in from day one. And ultimately, my American brothers and sisters and my Israeli brothers and sisters, you, more than anyone else, need to realize that you are like sheep being led to slaughter. The world will not tolerate the insane state-sponsored terrorism that you have gotten away with for the better part of the last century. And ultimately, unless you change course rather quickly, you will be the own instigator of your own demise. Now, make no mistake, however, this show will fearlessly, unapologetically, be politically incorrect. It will be stimulating and it will back up what I say. I will invite the top minions of the powers that be to come on this program. Restate your lies if you like. Only here you'll be directly challenged and any lies you try to pass off as truth will be exposed without any question. No later. Now later in the program we will be talking and taking a call or two and hearing from you. The number to dial is plus four four two oh three seven one four twenty seven hundred. Now on today's show, my very first guest will be Gilad Atzman, a true legend. After Gilad, we'll be preparing, premiering our Life in Gaza series, incredible series, wait till you see it. We will also have the People's Voice correspondent in Gaza, Noor Harazin, giving us the latest from Gaza. And lastly, we'll talk to the man himself, David Icke, in, in order to close the program. I'm so happy to say that my first guest is the most fitting guest, as we are both politically incorrect. And as it gets, I am speaking of my dear brother, Gilad Axman. I spoke to Gilad earlier this week and the only problem with our conversation was, was, was it was really way too short. Part of the reason I feel such a connection to Gilad is that we have somewhat similar stories. Both of us are, were very proud of our birth nations. Gilad was born with the idea of chosenness and his Jewish identity. I was uh, an American supremacist without even knowing it, thinking my nation is the greatest on earth. Both of us served in the military. Both of us experienced war. Most important of all, we both came to a point where we realized that we had been lied to and indoctrinated. So, without further ado, I'd like to take us into our introduction to Gilad Atzman. Gilad Atzman is a jazz musician, philosopher and writer, born in Israel in 1963. Subsequently, he was raised as an Israeli patriot. In the film, Gilad and All That Jazz, he says being raised as a Jew in Israel was wonderful because he really believed himself to be a chosen person. However, during the 1982 war with Lebanon, while serving in the Israeli military, which is compulsory, Gilad began to realize that he was badly misled about Israel and Zionism. It was only then that he began to grasp his affinity with the Palestinian people and their cause, and this, in turn, largely shaped the emotional context and style of his music. It was during this personal awakening that he declared himself an enemy of the Jewish state and eventually exiled himself to London. In the last 20 years, Gilad has produced many critically acclaimed jazz albums and a multitude of texts about Israel, Palestine and Jewish identity politics. Gilad's latest book, The Wandering Who, was a powerful challenge to deeply held societal taboos. It was unapologetically critical of his birth nation and the overt racism he was intimately familiar with. The book was endorsed by some of the greatest humanists of our times and, ironically, his critics only boosted its popularity. The book has become that, the most like popular text about Jewish dear, dear identity friend, politics brother, and yet, brother, unsurprisingly, it Thank caused so considerable much. controversy with denouncements coming from Jews and even some Palestinians. A cursory read of his critics, however, will reveal that the quotes out of context, misquotes, and garden variety character assassinations form the overwhelming majority of their criticisms. While it is undeniable that Gilad lacks any political correctness, the depth of his intellectual analysis and the beauty of his music can hardly be questioned. He remains a most compelling figure 
and one who is leaving an indelible mark on music and culture alike. And with that, I'd like to introduce my dear, dear friend, a brother, a true brother, Gilad Asman. Thank you so much for coming to the program. It's so fitting to have you on the very first program, and uh, I just really can't thank you enough. Now, if there was anyone to discuss these issues with, it really is you. And what I'd like to start with is control of language. Obviously, there's one word, the J word in particular, which we find as soon as you use that word, automatically you're going to reap the wrath of uh, an entire segment of the human population which has the resources to literally destroy careers. And yet, there have been people who have courageously stood up and spoken the truth in this regard, you being one of them. I'd like for you to tell us about your experience in speaking frankly and the empowerment of the control of language, how this affects us, how it prevents proper debate. Yeah, I think that uh, it is very clear I'll be very, I try to be as very precise, uh, sorry, I'll try to be as precise about it as I can. Um, Israel defines itself as the Jewish state. It commits crimes in the name of the Jewish people, whether the Jewish people like it or not. Um, it decorates its tanks and airplanes with Jewish symbols, and yet, we are not allowed to scrutinize, to try to understand, to try to grasp who are the Jews, what is Judaism, what is Jewishness, what are the relationship between Jews, Judaism, Jewishness, and Zionism, for instance. And interestingly enough, the people who actually walk 24-7 trying to stop us from doing it, are not the Zionists. They are just part of it. It is actually the so-called Jewish left, the progressive uh, Jewish lobby, the Jews within the Palestinian Solidarity Movement, people like um, Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, Max Blumenthal, uh, Real News uh, guy, uh, Paul Jay, Mondo Wise to a certain extent, Mondo Wise that is actually now a leading uh, outlet uh, on issues to do with Palestine, uh, changed their uh, comments policy and actually al they declared that they don't allow any discussion on Jewish culture, Jewish identity and so on and so on. Now, this leads us to the notion of Jewish power. What is Jewish power? I came to realize that Jewish power is the capacity to stop us from talking about Jewish power. <laughs> this is what it is. And this is something that uh, is facilitated mainly by the so-called good Jews. Now, in my work, I'm very careful to differentiate or to try to understand the J word, what it means. I differentiate between Jews, the people, which I never talk about. Judaism, the religion, there's some a very troubling aspect in uh, Judaism, but there are quite a few troubling aspects in many other religions. Mm. And as a matter of fact, we have to remember that uh, rabbinical Jews have never been involved in any in pre-israel pre uh, pre-zionist era in a in a genocidal or kind of a collective uh, crime against uh, anyone so judaism can easily get off the hook well, this however is, this is but jewishness jewishness jewish ideology jewish culture this attempt to dominate the discourse to plant uh, I would use the, uh, the, the, the Orwellian uh, um, language to plant um, Emmanuel Goldsteins all around us mm. and to impose newspeak on us, tell us what we are allowed to talk and what we are not allowed to talk. This is definitely 
um, part of uh, Jewish culture. Sorry. And this really, this really explains, doesn't it, uh, ever since the creation of the Jewish state uh, in 1948, for decades, literally, there has been no possibility to discuss this issue in any kind of accurate way. Because once again, as soon as you even open your mouth and utter the word Jewish, when, ref when referring to the Jewish state of Israel, which is a great irony in itself, is it not? We're yeah. talking about a state of Israel which self-defines itself as the Jewish state. The Jewish state that allows uh, Jewish people from around the world at any point to come back to the land of Israel and to ultimately... To the land of Palestine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And yet this is, this is the kind of language uh, confines that we've had for many decades. And I think this explains a lot about the suffering of the Palestinian people. We haven't yeah. even been able to discuss this in, a, in an open and honest way. It is even more interesting when you think about it because within Israel you can discuss those issues, I would say still, openly, relatively. Isn't that ironic? You know, this is, this is, this is, this is true. You know, I, um, a few years ago I had a, a very, um, an extended uh, interview with me in Arbitz and I basically said everything. However, I wouldn't be able to say the same things in The Guardian, mm -hmm. because The Guardian is not the guardian of the truth, is the guardian of the, of the discourse, or uh, if to be more precise, the guardian of Jewish power and Jewish interests. And this is extremely, extremely concerning, and it is very concerning for Jewish people as well. Should well, be concerning. Well, this, and that's, that's another irony, and, and the, the irony of life is, is just dripping all around us, quite frankly, because I, I myself, I have no animosity towards any group of people. In fact, I, I hold people individually responsible for what they do. But of course, I also have the perspective that we as people who come from various nations have to take responsibility for the actions of our nations. I, my greatest scorn is without doubt for my birth nation of the United States. And I hold the American people responsible for the actions of that government. Because ultimately, no one else could possibly change the course of the American government's policies except for the American people. And it's all too easy for us to sit down and say, oh, well, I didn't vote for that party. Or, oh, you know, they're corrupt, the government's corrupt. Well, they're corrupt because you allow them to be so. And in the case of the state of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel, there is clearly a huge amount of effect that the Jewish people around the world could have on this, on this nation. But they're not, overwhelmingly, sadly. And while there are growing numbers of Jews around the world who are becoming increasingly discontented with the policies of Israel for very obvious reasons, it still enjoys enormous support from Jewish it people is, around the world. You are totally right here, but it is a very, very complicated topic. You see, in Britain, in, in America, we are complicit uh, in the crimes committed by Tony Blair in Iraq or, or George Bush and so on and so on and so on. But the situation of the Jews around the world is more complicated. Similarly, the vast majority of Israel, uh, Israelis, 94% of Israelis, uh, um, supported the, uh, the genocidal tactics used by the, by the Israeli and do you think army. That, and do you think if that happened again today, if we had another caste led, do you think that they would enjoy, the state of Israel would enjoy the same level of support today? Do you think that's changed um, at all? It is very possible, and as you probably know, it is very easy to manipulate uh, people to support uh, a governmental criminal act. So, so, so the fact that uh, people support it or oppose it is uh, very interesting. What I uh, really uh, found out in my research is that the problem is not Jews per se. I started to ask myself, who are the people who identify themselves as Jews? So obviously the first category that comes to mind is the, the people who regard themselves as Jews because they follow the Torah, they follow Judaism. This is in itself could be an innocent category. The second category are people who regard themselves as Jews because they have Jewish ancestry. They have a Jewish mother, a Jewish father, or whatever, they're somehow connected. Obviously, the fact that you have a fa Jewish father doesn't make you into a criminal. The third category is slightly more problematic. The third category is those people who see themselves primarily as Jews. Chaim Weizmann uh, allegedly said uh, in the early uh, 20th century that there are no 
French Jews, American Jews, Russian Jews, but Jews who live in Russia, Jews who live in France, Jews who live in England, and so on and so on. And, isn't, and this is a, a really interesting point, isn't it? Because if, of many things that, that you can say about the Jewish people, it is actually quite admirable how, in general, the Jewish people stick together. They actually have a very strong community, a tribal... This is, this is, this is exactly where, where I'm, 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 I'm heading now. So, Zionism is definitely people who see themselves primarily as Jews. Interestingly enough, the, anti the Jewish anti-Zionists also see themselves, in many cases, primarily as Jews. They operate in Jews only cells like JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, International Jews, uh, Jewish Anti-Zionists, Jews for Peace, Jews for Dead. Just quickly on this point, because yeah. I feel it's so important. Is this the cleverness and the deception of the so-called anti-Zionist Jews in that while they're against supposedly the state of Israel, in truth, they do identify themselves as Jews first and foremost. And how can you do that and also object to the Jewish state of Israel? They do support the Jewish state of Israel. They don't necessarily support the policies, or at least not publicly. Is this, is this a really clever deception? Is it a self-deception? Is, is it an overt uh, you know, public to tell deception? You the truth, to tell you the truth, I think that it's laziness. I think, I think that they didn't think it through. And one of the reasons uh, that uh, they invested, their leaders invested so much energy to silence me is because I exposed those issues. I argue that if the, the anti-Zionism is a, a battle for justice and a universal battle for justice, you cannot operate or, or, or move it forward fighting with zeal a racially centric Jew, Jews only uh, political environment. It should, it is actually, Jews are much more offended when a Jew start to say, I don't want to say it as a Jew. I don't want to say it as a um, diaspora Jew. I want to talk as a human being. This is where the tribe is falling apart. This is the true meaning of assimilation. Yeah. Now, this is exactly the thing that Jewish Zionists and anti-Zionists try to prevent. They say, oh, you don't have to go away. You stay with us. We will fight together as Jews. <laughs> In other words, I argue that every person who identifies politically as a Jew is a potential danger, whether it is pro-Zionist or anti-Zionist. But, but, but I think that this is a really important point to uh, make clear on this, because I know you as a person, and, and I respect you deeply, and I think we're very very much the same in that we, we want what's best for everyone. We really do. So while it's, it's, it's the same, it doesn't matter if it's Jewish or if it's a, a neo-Nazi. If you identify with one group and put that group above all others, if you do that, whatever form it takes, it's, yeah. against, it's against any kind of humanist value, universalist values. And if you combine that kind of mentality, which could l very well be called supremacism, if you believe That's your group is. is more important or better than other groups, yeah. that form of supremacism in itself is offensive. But when you combine that kind of supremacism with power and politics, becomes, in politics it becomes extremely problematic, especially in the nuclear age. And this, for me, is my problem w with this situation, and that yeah. fact, well, we can't talk about it. And this is why, this is why I don't talk about Jews, the people, or Judaism. I talk about the supremacist, chauvinist, and in most cases, racist ideology that is found at the core of the Jewish tribal identity. And this is the issue, mm. and this is the, the, the topic that they really try to prevent us from talking about. Do you, do you think there's a way for Jewish people, and all other people for that matter, because I also believe that people should be proud of who they are. I think, for instance, black people, black people in America were constantly uh, belittled and, and, and offended and, and just, just violated to the point where it took a person like Malcolm X to help bring them back up and to be proud of who you are. Don't be ashamed of who you are. So I think that there's nothing wrong with that, including for white people, for all people. Yeah. There's no reason why you, ta you shouldn't take pride in who you are. But is there a way for us to be proud of who we are, wherever we come from, and also be good human beings that can share this planet in a way that's sustainable, that's just, and respectful of others? Can this, the Jewish people do this? This is 
the most important question. I'm not against tribalism. I'm not against patriotism. I'm not against nationalism. I actually support the, the Palestinian patriotism, the Palestinian nationalism. I, all, I would also support Jewish patriotism and Israeli patriotism. But patriotism and tribalism and chauvinism become very dangerous when it is celebrated on the expense of someone else. And mm. this is the most simple principle. For instance, Zionism is celebrated clearly on the expense of the Palestinians. But anti-Zionism, um, as, as it happens to be, you know, um, imposing uh, their hegemony on us, and we can talk about it later if you want. I can show each term in that kind of in the that stands as a term, terminological pillar of our understanding of the conflict in in the Middle East is imposed on us by anti Jewish anti Zionist. Each uh, such a strategy is actually celebrated on the expense of ourselves as free spiritual human beings. Well, that, that's a perfect segue into our next segment. And, and on that note, I definitely want to get back into the manipulation of language and the notions of Jewish power. And as per usual, a conversation with my dear, dear friend, Gilad Atzman, is stimulating, as always. And we'll be back in just a moment. We would say that there is a post-colonial stage. But no, if we are dealing with a unique Jewish national project that we don't understand because we are prevented from looking into it, we don't know where it ends, we don't know what are the possible consequences, mm. and we don't, we don't even allow to understand the history of this movement. Well, this, this is, this is a, a, I think, a, a very, very good example of just how important attention to detail with regard to language is. And when we're not allowed to use the, the proper language, we can't really solve our problems. To take this to another level, you've talked about something which is extremely important. And having worked in issues regarding Palestine for many years now, um, I find it very insidious, a, an excellent example of how powerful infiltration can be. And when we talk about uh, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, um, uh, you have helped reveal something which is really amazing, the change in the mission statement yeah. of the BDS <laughs> campaign. Now, while I think any sensible person would agree that we should not be giving our money to any institution that is actively involved in policies that equate to genocide or torture or death, but on that note, I have to say, I, f I think Israel has a really strong argument when they say, we're being unfairly uh, pointed out here because I don't understand why there's not an organized boycott against America at all. I don't understand this. How could this, how could the American nation avoid an active boycott from around the world and have that be the most uh, strongest campaign ever when in fact this nation, my birth nation, has committed all of these crimes. So in this sense, I actually really agree with the Jews um, and the Jewish people and the, the people of Israel in particular. But the bottom line is, let's talk about this uh, boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign yeah. and the change in the mission statement. Yeah, this is, this is uh, shocking. Back in the, um, 2005, um, the BDS movement uh, was formed and it came up with uh, three mission statements. And the first uh, mission statement uh, st stated that uh, the movement is against, against colonization of all Arab land, full stop. A year ago, and this is when 170, 170 yeah. Palestinian organizations right. uh, are uh, signed. So uh, they all signed on to this yeah. uh, mission statement. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 18 months ago, uh, I realized that this mission statement was changed. It said, we are against uh, the colonization of all Arab land occupied in 1967. Now, this is a crucial issue because the initial uh, statement was obviously referring to um, 1948 as well as 1967 and it opposed actually the existence of the Jewish state. This, this was the issue of this, uh, of, uh, this uh, first uh, goal uh, yes. uh, statement. So who's this has been done. This has been done uh, without, uh, in, in a clandestine manner. I started to look into it with the help of some uh, major academics um, that are involved in this discourse. And we were very quick to find out that uh, the guy that actually made the change already in his book was a Palestinian activist named Omar Barghouti, 
who, by the way, in spite of the call to boycott uh, Israeli uh, uh, um, academic, uni uh, 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 academic uh, institutions, himself studied in Tel Aviv University, which is slightly peculiar, mm -hmm. which is slightly peculiar. Since the BDS is also calling for academic boycotts as yeah, well as... Yeah, the part of it is, uh, which is, by the way, I'm not against uh, the BDS uh, movement, but I do have a pro, I, I do have an issue uh, with, uh, with an academic and cultural boycott. I actually believe, I actually believe that uh, for the benefit of humanity, we must be committed to freedom of speech and ideally here today we should have a uh, Zionist who would argue who would argue with us and present uh, present their cause and you know we should be open to the fa to the possibility that he mm. may be right I think that he, we wouldn't but but uh, so I, I, the, the real issue here is that uh, I, I from the way I see it is that infiltration is is one of the most little least understood issues of our time and yet it's so blatant let's say for example the United States Congress I'm not sure that it's infiltration and this is a very interesting when I started to look into it I found out that uh, a lot of European money uh, it's not a secret. Is um, a lot of fun, a lot of Europe, EU funding, uh, American funding finds its way uh, to to uh, Palestine, and a lot of money from the Open Society Institute that actually is associated with George Soros, who is also a liberal Zionist who funds the J Street. So, you know, the thing is that they don't need, uh, we can just follow the money trail, the money trail, and understand why uh, some Palestinians, like Omar Barghouti, for instance, uh, are, easy, uh, are easy to compromise, to compromise uh, the most uh, precious uh, Palestinian principles. But is that not the vehicle? The, the money comes in, that's the vehicle to allow for the infiltration. Once, yeah. you've, got the, once you've got people on the inside, yeah. now you can, you can manipulate the discourse. I know this intimately well because while I've done my best to try and help uh, in the Palestinian cause, mostly by exposing my government in the EU, um, I've, I've constantly experienced the problems with inside the movement itself to the point that I find it uh, pretty much impossible to even work inside of the solidarity, so-called solidarity movement because of the politics, because of the political correctness, because of the insanity and the, uh, the circus as I call it. And I believe that you know, this infiltration has occurred and, and it's quite masterful. I have to say, I have to give credit to those that are using these tactics because they're extremely effective. And trying to expose it is actually, it's, it's a bit of a task to say the least. They are very, they are very, very uh, successful in paralyzing um, the Palestinian people. What are NGOs? and civil societies. There are actually systems that are there all over the world, not just in Palestine, that are, they are there to neutralize young dissent. You see, oh my God, this guy is gifted. Let's pour some money on him and see how he reacts. And they react. And, and that, this is the state for uh, Palestine right now, actually. They are, per capita, the largest recipients of, of human an humanitarian aid on the planet. And I yeah. look and I see this process uh, very similar to the way I see black Americans who ultimately, in the aftermath of slavery, and then they turned that into sharecropping, they were yeah. still slaves. Then they were supposedly free, really free, and they basically they hooked the, the black people to a large degree on something called welfare. And under the welfare yeah. state... Um, you, 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 turn nation, you turn nation, oppress nation into beggars. This is, this, is, this is what's happening to the people of Palestine, and it really it, it breaks one's heart to see this because the best within Palestine are effectively being bribed by these NGOs because these NGOs come in with so much money that they can pay several times as much as the private sector in Palestine can pay. So all the best gravitate towards the NGOs, but once they've got them in the NGOs, now they can control the discourse. They can control where the, the money and the energy is being directed, and this is exactly what's happening to the point that we see a system in Palestine, which is really the system that receives the money, is set up to facilitate so-called security for the oppressor. Um, I totally agree. Now, when we look at uh, the situation in Palestine, um, we should take it as a test case of a paralyzed solidarity movement and a paralyzed um, liberation movement. I don't know what we can offer the Palestinians now, but what we could do, 
we can clearly spot and detect the, the tactics that was used, uh, that has been used and is still used in order to manipulate the discourse, we can easily identify the bodies that are corrupting the, this discourse, the bodies uh, within even Palestine, uh, I mentioned uh, um, Omar Baghouti, people who clearly um, compromise on precious uh, principles. With the hope, with the hope that um, at a certain stage um, justice uh, may prevail. You know, I'm myself. I'm I'm not not an activist. I've never been. Um, uh, I never participated in in a demonstration. I don't believe. I don't believe uh, in these issues. I believe. I believe in the real meaning of the first. Amendment. I believe that once we start to say what we believe in, what we say, what we think, what we feel, the world will change accordingly. Well, and with that, Gilad, I have to say thank you so much for coming on this program because uh, it is absolutely 100% sure that you have the kind of conviction and strength to speak honestly and frankly. And I think this is exactly where we need to go in this world if we're really serious. I feel the same about you, brother. Thank, thank you, you so much, much my brother. Great, Fantastic man. to have you. Pleasure. And with that, I hope to have Gilad on many, many more times, and uh, if I have my way, he certainly will be here. So, on to the next segment. Palestine, a microcosm of our world. The way of Palestine is the way of our world. Palestine is the mirror we peer into and see our naked failures. The mirror reflecting tears of a weeping mother, the hopelessness of a destitute child. Shifting blame is the name of the game, but the reality of Palestine is the stain on the consciousness of humanity. How could it be otherwise? Shifting responsibility is to disconnect even further from the truth. The blame shifter is the devil's advocate. The objective of this film is to shatter the collective punishment blockade of Gaza to pieces. Over 800,000 children in Gaza are our mandate. This is proactive versus reactive. This is action versus paralysis. This is truth versus lies. This is justice versus tyranny. Justice in Palestine equals justice in our world. It is our self-fulfilling destiny. It is not negotiable. Dignity, not charity. Truth, not lies. Justice, not tyranny. Trade, not aid. Well, I'd like to thank my good brother Gilad Aspen once again for that interview, which if you hadn't noticed I was wearing different clothes. I'm not shape-shifting, if that was your concern. Uh, we taped that earlier this week. Now, getting back to trade, not aid, uh, this is a project that I had been a part of for many, many years, and my thinking was, and remains to this day, that aid is not the answer. In fact, as we discussed uh, in that interview with Gilad, aid is very much part of the problem. It's sort of a bribery. It takes some of the best within society, and you use infiltration to subvert the best interests of the people. I believe that the only way the Palestinians will enjoy any kind of dignity in their lives is when they can stand on their own two feet, and it uh, disturbs me and angers me that more energy has not been put into carrying out a trade mission from the European Union, ultimately challenging anyone who would stand in the way of those of us who will insist on doing fair trade with our brothers and sisters in Gaza and the West Bank so that they can stimulate their businesses, get their factories reopened, and ultimately stand on their own two feet and live in dignity. Now, that brings me up to the Samouni family, a family that I spent time with in Gaza when I lived there for six months, a family that I love dearly and who I'm pained to not have been able to help more uh, than I have. The Samouni family, if you don't know their story, is mind-blowing, quite frankly. The Samouni family live in an area of Gaza called Zaytun. This area is a very rural area. It's in the middle of the Gaza Strip, and the Israelis generally tend to use that area to split the Gaza Strip in two. Strategically, it's quite important to them. Uh, during Operation Cast Lead, the Samouni family, which is around 200-plus members, uh, in that area were basically herded into one of the family homes. Over a hundred of them 
were herded into a, a, a small home. That home was then hit by several rockets within 24 hours. Now you've got to imagine there's dozens of children, there's mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, and ultimately there was about 30 members of the family almost instantly killed. We're talking about body parts all over the place, we're talking about women, uh, mothers and fathers lying next to the corpses of their children, children lying next to the corpses of their mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, blood and guts, and for four and a half days the Samuni family was not allowed any medical attention. No food, no water, no electricity, no heating in the dead of winter, and blood and guts everywhere for four and a half days. Imagine the trauma. Imagine your child enduring such a thing. This is the Samuni family for you, and yet they're only one family. But there was one experience I had in Gaza that has profoundly affected me, and that is the story of a most beautiful loving woman and mother named Zainat Samuni. And also, <coughs> Amal here, she stayed three days under, uh, under the, uh, the uh, destroyed home till they came and took her. <laughs> لكن دائما يعني بتشكي حاجة على رأسها يعني ودان ودان من الأخير بس. She's saying that Amal she she always have this headache and she cried and she have bleeding from her nose because the she needs a surgery in her head. There's a problem and they could not do the surgery here in Gaza and till now uh, she had this problem, headache, can't see the normal bleeding from she, her. She wants to send a message to the mom of the soldier that killed her husband and her kid and she's saying uh, you, you, your son, he's not. He's, we can't say that he's Israeli or he's he's Jewish. He's he's not even a human. He's he's not a human. He he do not deserve to live because um, only the unhuman people who could kill kids 
who could take a father from his family, who could take a mom from her family, who could take the kids from her, their mom, who could do this are unhuman people. We are just unhuman. I have seven kids, how could the seven kids live without a father? They, they lost the, the most priceless thing. There's no one to, to call on Baba. Yeah, also, they had these dreams with their father, but now after their father dead, her little kid, is learning Baba, but there's no dad, there's no dad too. Uh, do you want to go to dad? And the, the, the kid say, yes, yes, I want to. But she hug her and say, no, you will not, not now, you're little. You're still young. She's saying that her little kid just know her father from some photos. لما شفت ابني أحمد سعيدة كشفت وعي
she was saying that uh, he was with his uncle and she went when she escaped and went to a home uh, she was like give me my son I want my son where is my son and he was like okay your son is with me don't worry he's with me she was like give it to me but he did, he did not g give him to her another one took him and she was like screaming just give me my son when she when they give it give him to her and she saw his chest the bullets in, in his head and his chest she started to cry and she thought he he he's he's dead but after uh, she sat down and she saw that he was still breathing and she was like oh my god he's he's alive just call an ambulance call anyone just call anyone and and, and tell them to come my Ahmed is alive I, I want him to I want them to make him a surgery and you know he will survive he's alive so when she when they started to call people and hospitals they was like no that area is a closed area we can't come in if we come in they will shoot us we can't we can't go in that area and she's saying that after a few hours he was like uh, I want some water so she put some water on his, in, uh, on his lips and she feed him a little bit of bread and then at the evening he was like mom I'm going to paradise don't be sad I'm gonna take dad with me to paradise and that's mo that moment she knew that this is the last time she saw or talked to Ahmed because he was dying in the last moments in the evening she's saying that I, I want you to send a message to the world to tell them that how much difference those between families in Gaza and families in uh, other places in the world, other countries, uh, they have happiness, they have fun with uh, with their family member. Uh, kids will not lose uh, their parents uh, by killing. Um, I want you to see my life. How do I I live without a husband, without my son, without even my home? This is not her home. This is uh, her cousin's home. Uh, how could I feed all of these seven kids? How could I take care of them? I just want the the world to see the life that I'm living. Shukran ya khalto la anu anti la anti na sura hai. Ahna mnitmana no ahna ahna mnitmana no ahna yani kuna nadem isha aktar min hek bas no ahna la 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 nemalo. This is uh, little Ahmed from the uh, Samuni family as well. As you can see, shot twice. You can uh, try and imagine what uh, what made the Israelis think that this little boy was a threat. Well, he's certainly uh, certainly not a threat anymore, is he? My next guest is somebody that I worked with in Gaza for several months. Uh, she was actually the translator and presenter for many programs that we were shooting in Gaza. Those programs, the editing was only just finished in the last few weeks. And so we're going to familiarize you with many of the families that we visited in Gaza. And amongst those families, uh, which each one of them had an incredible story, but of all the people we met in Gaza, uh, Zainat had an incredible story. And with that, I'd like to bring in our correspondent in Gaza, uh, Noor Harazin. Noor, how are you doing? Well, I've heard you've got a bit of a flu, but uh, and you've also got electricity issues to deal with. But thank you so much for coming on. Um, can you please tell us? Uh, you were just with Zainat in the last week. Can you please tell us how she's doing now and, and what is the overall condition for the family? Um, she's good. The kids are good, but of course um, that memory, what happened with them uh, seven years ago, is still living with them in that home. The pictures of Ahmed and his father. Um, is all around the house. 
and um, every day they remember them. Every time I visit them or anyone even visit them to ask about the story, they remember them. Um, uh, Mahmoud, uh, the uh, oldest uh, son of Zinat, he's now 15 years old. Yeah. He's now acting like the man of the home after, uh, of course, he lost uh, his father. Uh, Mahmoud, he's, he's in the school, but at the same time, these days he's trying to find uh, a job, something to work, even when he's uh, only 15, just to offer his family some financial help. Um, yeah. Another sad thing with the family is that their uh, daughter, Aman, uh, she, uh, as we know, um, was injured with the shrapnels in her head. Until today, especially in winter, uh, Amal bleeds every morning from her nose because the shrapnels fell in her head. And the problem why she did not have any surgery in Gaza or even in Egypt is because the doctors were so afraid that uh, taking these shrapnels out or removing them will uh, take her life. So um, this is also another step has to this is and this is this is the, the the whole family each one of the each one of the individuals of the Samuni family has got an incredible story to tell and you know the program we just aired didn't even talk about Amal who's just this beautiful beautiful young girl who still got these fragments of uh, metal in her head um, from several years ago and she has headaches and 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 she has constant problems with the bleeding as Nora is saying and I mean, it pains me to hear this because I, I was hoping to do so much more for this family and, and others in Gaza. And yet, here we are uh, several years later, and the situation overall really hasn't gotten any better at all, has it, Nora? True. Of course, nothing happened. I mean, um, Amal, since you left, Amal uh, left once uh, to an Arab country, but she left only to attend this like five days conference. But unfortunately, what we did not see is like um, an action to really help them, other than um, only talking about them. You know, yeah. what they need is 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 help, is a serious help. And this is and this is it, and and, and this is only one family. Um, w when we were there, we we met over 20 different families, and again, each one of them had an incredible tale. I remember, however, very, very vividly when, when we were in uh, Zainat's home, uh, recalling they were living on, in, a, in the bottom, what was the garage, on a dirt floor. That, that was where they were living. Their, their house had been, had been shut, uh, completely destroyed, and they were living on a dirt floor in a garage uh, with seven kids. And I remember very distinctly coming out of Zainat's house, and I, I just had this absolute understanding that I needed to do something for this family. That whatever I had plans, I was already doing things, but I had to do something. It just hit me like a ton of bricks, and and it it, it, it kills me to this day that I've not been able to do more, and that the situation is actually even worse in many respects. And and this is again, it, it, it's not just this family, the Samuni family. It's virtually everyone in Gaza is experiencing some sort of trauma and uh, stress uh, de deliberately instigated by the Israelis. And that brings us to our next point, which is, what's the latest with Israel? There's more violations of the truce agreements, but can you give us the latest details on what's happening in that regard? Uh, in the last week, there uh, have been several more crates. Small crates are uh, sonic bombs, basically fake crates, only like a voice. Um, and these raids are being used to, to scare the people of Gaza, to, to make them panic and fear a new war. Um, also, uh, they shot a man uh, yes, uh, on Friday, uh, the last Friday. They shot a man in his leg. He was walking uh, close to the buffer zone, not in the buffer zone, but close to the buffer, buffer zone, uh, in Jabalia camp, north of Gaza, uh, and they uh, shot him. Well, this, this is, is the and this is just this is just normal. This is par for the course. I'm absolutely convinced that uh, the Israelis, at, at high levels, basically give sanction to uh, shooting or killing Palestinians in a low-level sort of atrocities that don't make the news. We'll never hear about that. Only those of us paying 
uh, close attention to what's happening in Palestine and Gaza. We'll even hear about that sort of stuff. But this is a regular occurrence, is it not? Even children are being shot for things such as collecting rocks, which are then taken and crushed because of the lack of building materials. I mean, tell us about this, how these things are happening uh, with regularity. Is, is, is it possible that these things are an accident, or do you think this is an intentional policy of regular shootings and killings of people there? Uh, yes, of course. And as you said, it became something normal for, for us. It became something like daily life, you know. Uh, first, the small raids of shooting people uh, around the, uh, the buffer zone, the borders. It became something normal because even not this week, the one before, they shot also uh, two men uh, close to the border. So, and because also uh, the Western media are not reporting these kind of violations, uh, it becomes something normal even for the Israeli side to commit these crimes, to commit these violations. Uh, it's like somehow like sending us a message that basically they can do whatever they want, they can violate, they can commit crimes. Um, and basically even the news, even the news of this violation is not going to be out to people around the world. And this is, you know, what passes for normal in Gaza is, is hard for most to imagine. I, I always think about uh, when I hear a helicopter go overhead here in London, um, of course, it's normal. You, you hear a helicopter go overhead. And most people, if they hear that sound, it doesn't mean anything other than there's a helicopter. But in Gaza, if a helicopter or more likely a drone, which the drones have that droning sound, as you well know, and that sound is going around all the time. For many of the children in particular, keeping in mind that Gaza has 800,000 plus children, over half of the population is children, which really is part of what is the shame of humanity that we've allowed this for so long. But for many of them, uh, you, you know as well as I do, they've been traumatized by many of these ongoing attacks. Some of them have witnessed uh, family members blown apart. Uh, they've lost loved ones in the most uh, obscene of ways. And when they hear that sound of a helicopter or, or a, a fighter jet or a drone flying overhead, it brings back memories of what was happening in the moments before that rocket came in and devastated their family. So this is an ongoing uh, systematic traumatization of the people of Gaza, which virtually everyone in Gaza to one level or degree suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. But in particular, it's the children, of course, who are suffering most from this. I mean, can you tell me from your own personal point of view how this affects people just having this constant threat of a, a, of a pending attack, how does it affect people there? I mean, you know what, it's, it's, it's not even the children anymore, even, uh, even us, even the old people. And you can imagine if it's more than the voice of the warplanes, because these small crates, these sonic bombs, became a daily action by the uh, Israeli occupation warplanes. So when anyone hears the, the, the voice of this big explosion just close to them, and they, they do these explosions, the, these small crates, in very populated, densely uh, areas in Gaza. So. Uh, it's just, you're just being traumatized, you just think, where did they attack, or uh, maybe someone died, maybe it hit my family, I should go back home, and then after minutes, oh, okay, the news is up, it's a more crate. The kind of, of panic and the kind of, of, of fear they want to spread in between Gazans, it's, uh, I, I can't find basically words to explain how, how do we really feel, but it's, I mean, you was here. It's uh, sometimes it's really hard to explain by words. But when you was here, you yourself even uh, listened to these voices, experienced that, and it's just what could I say? More than it's it's making us stronger. It's it's making us realize that what they want is to make us fear them. But I don't think that this will happen. Well, this is the great irony, isn't it? I mean, I've often said to people in uh, America and Western audiences that if, if we were subjected to the kind of treatment that the Palestinians have endured for many, many decades, there's no doubt in my mind that it would be beyond bloody. Uh, you know, when, when I think it's, it's outrageous and it angers me when I hear people talk about uh, the violence of the Palestinians, when in fact, given what the Palestinian people have endured, I find them to be remarkably patient and reserved. The overwhelming majority of Palestinians, whether it's in the West Bank or Gaza, 
have uh, dealt with what is an incredibly unjust circumstance, an extremely violent one, and overwhelmingly are responding with nonviolent means of resistance. Of course, you have those who will resist with violence, but I myself know that there is no doubt at all that if I were subjected to this that I would have, I would have clearly uh, involved myself in resistance of all forms. So uh, with that said, I, I just want to express once again my, my deepest of respect to the people of Gaza and the people of Palestine. And when we get back, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the, the Arab Spring and ultimately what the change of Mubarak, uh, the ousting of Mubarak and the great hope that was occurring at that time. I was there at that time and the reality since the so-called Arab Spring. If we can, when we get back, let's please talk about that. Welcome back to the program. Once again, I've got Noor Harazin, our TPV correspondent in Gaza, on the line. And we were talking just before the break there, Noor, about the Arab Spring. When Mubarak fell, I know how it was there in Gaza, the excitement was tremendous. All of us, everyone, I think, around the world was excited. But no one could be more excited, I suppose, than the people outside of Egypt than the people of Gaza. Um, everybody thought that the border, Rafah border, would be opened, uh, at least within a short period of time. But overall, can you talk about the excitement of that time and what's happened since the fall of Mubarak? Um, I mean, everyone was happy. The fact, um, whenever we remember that Sebi Livni visited Egypt and sat with Mubarak and the next day, 2008-2009, uh, war was launched on Gaza, known as uh, Kastlid, um, Everyone felt really happy that Mubarak is gone because everyone uh, started thinking of a new life for Gazans. The opening of borders, trade, uh, uh, no one even thought that uh, a new war is going to happen. Everything was, everything even became better. Uh, after uh, Mubarak is gone, Mohammed Mursi came, uh, everything for Palestinians, for Gazans was much better. Um, I remember that even when the second war in Gaza was launched in 2012, known as the Pillar of Clouds, I was in Beirut and I came to Gaza very easily and I entered Gaza in the second day to cover the news of the war. But during the first war, when Mubarak was ruling Egypt, everything was closed. Border work were closed. People who had injuries in the war could not leave Gaza to get treatment in Egypt. Um, medical uh, materials were stuck outside of the border on the Egyptian side because they did not let them in. But since Mohammed Morsi uh, came to Egypt, everything was easier. Uh, people were able to come and uh, leave Gaza freely during all of that time. But again, after the military took over Egypt, everything directly changed. Uh, in one month, 90% of Gaza's lifelines, which is the tunnels, were destroyed, completely destroyed. Imagine how Gaza, 80% of, of uh, of uh, the goods that people take in Gaza are from the tunnels. So imagine if these lifelines just are destroyed and they close the border. These days they open the border for one day uh, a week, sometimes two days, sometimes they spend like two or three weeks without opening the border. Students are being stuck in Gaza who have universities in Europe and um, other countries. Uh, patients are being stuck. Only one month ago, a uh, little baby died on the border because his mom was stuck on the Egyptian side. Um, what can I say? I mean, it was a, a great happiness for the Palestinian people to say Mubarak is gone, but it was almost one year of, of, of one or two years of uh, feeling a little bit of freedom and a little bit of dignity before everything turns to even worse than uh, Well, this is, this is truly incredible. I, again, I mean, I almost feel naive ha having thought that in the aftermath of Mubarak's fall that, that things would change rather rapidly. And I had hoped that the Egyptian people, while very much being focused on their internal domestic issues, would put Gaza at the forefront. And I really found uh, myself being angry that uh, the border between Egypt and Gaza was not immediately opened, completely opened. I know that things obviously improved. You're, you're confirming that for some time. Um, but I still couldn't understand any valid reason why the Muslim Brotherhood didn't completely open that border. But since that time, 
it has now gotten even worse. Now, when I was there, uh, it was normal that you'd have uh, electricity um, out for at least eight hours a day. So, uh, you know, you, you'd have maybe 16 hours of electricity, eight hours gone, and sometimes more, a little bit less. But it's even worse now. And, and in the West, we just take this for granted that you have electricity. But what is the electricity situation like in Gaza right now? Uh, what happened, Ken, basically, is like 25 days ago, um, Gaza's only electricity plant shut down three of their four generators. Uh, so the number of uh, electricity blackout hours uh, in Gaza went up to 20 hours per day. So these days you can barely enjoy like four to six hours of electricity at your home. And um, we have never suffered such a price, like never. We used to have electricity for like uh, eight, uh, eight hours. Each day now we have it like for four, sometimes if it's uh, if it's good, it's six hours. But uh, it did not only affect electricity, basically, because of the fuel shortage. You can walk around Gaza these days and find like hundreds of students just standing in the streets waiting to find a taxi, a car to pick them up. And if they find one, they will pay double the price, even triple the price, just to go back home because there's no um, fuel to run these taxis and cars. And it's not only there also, uh, the hospitals, the situation of the hospitals in Gaza, it's going from bad to worse. We have uh, kidney failure patients, we have premature babies that are at risk uh, of dying any minute if the generator in the hospital uh, shut down. And this is a big problem. This, this reminds me also of when just going down the street in the main street in Gaza City uh, where the fumes are intense because they, when they obviously if they want to be open for business they need to have electricity so all of the shopkeepers have generators which means they all have to operate them with fuel, petrol and, and there's just fumes everywhere which in itself is incredibly unhealthy to say the least but now it's even difficult to get the fuel and I find it almost remarkable that the situation has gotten even worse um, in terms of the electricity but as you mentioned this actually puts people's lives at risk when we're talking about hospitals um, that rely on having electricity for certain equipment um, it really is just beyond a humanitarian uh, tragedy it's a willful intentional uh, policy of literally killing people who preventively could be saved I mean is there is there what how are people feeling about this are they feeling that this is going to drag on for any, a long long period of time are they hopeful that this is going to change soon what is the general mood with regard to the electricity the sewage uh, which is overflowing in areas what is the opinion of the people right now how are they feeling um, the amazing thing with the people uh, in Gaza is that they can live under any situation. They can just keep going, you know. If it's even two hours of electricity a day, they will just have that hope and just keep going, living their lives. Uh, as you mentioned, the shop, the shops in Gaza, they normally now close at uh, 5 p.m. My agency that I was planning to do uh, this talk with you in the studio of my uh, agency uh, did not have any fuel, uh, did not find any fuel uh, in, the, in Gaza to run the generators to work extra hours. But as you said, people do have hope because they have hope in Egypt, they have hope in PA, they have hope in in the international community, they have hope. And there have been some news that some fuel aid is going to enter Gaza in the next few days. Some news that the PA did not transfer money for um, the uh, for fuel in Gaza that being transported from the EU. There's so many. There's so many news. So many talking about this issue. But at the end, the people of Gaza do have that hope and think that this is going to end uh, sometime soon. I hope. Well, this is, this is one of the most stunning and striking things that I witnessed there as well, is the resilience of the people and how people can carry themselves with dignity in such an undignified uh, circumstance. One last thing I want to talk about, which is a story which is close to my heart because of my love for the sea, and that is the plight of the fishermen. Now, most people don't know this, but uh, the uh, waters off of Gaza, uh, which should be the territorial waters of Palestine, are effectively controlled by Israel. 
and ultimately the fishermen are only allowed to go out to three miles which is uh, ridiculously close and it prevents them from getting out to where the real stocks of fish are. This is probably another aspect of the policy of Israel putting the people of Gaza on a quote diet. Um, but even going out to three miles uh, regularly fishermen are shot at. Can you tell us what's happened in the last week? There's some more uh, experiences like this. Uh, basically, um, as the continuous Israeli violations of the truce around the borders of Gaza, same thing is happening with the Palestinian fishermen and the Israeli occupation navy. The Israeli occupation navy uh, violate the truce every day with the fishermen in Gaza. If they did not arrest them, they will uh, harass them inside the uh, three miles limit. If they did not harass them, they will. Uh, take their boats. Uh, there's so many actions from the Israeli Navy that do violate the troops in Gaza. Only uh, two days ago, yeah, exactly last week, um, two Palestinian fishermen from Rafah were arrested. Uh, until now, they did not let them go. But these actions are also daily. It's not only last week, but also the week before there was fishermen that were arrested. And the week before, fishermen were arrested. Um, there is, uh, there is an event that I would like to tell you about um, some youth in Gaza, a uh, very big youth group called the Antifada Youth Coalition, and they have uh, arranged this uh, event to take like um, 10 to 20 boats with uh, 200 people from Gaza and international activists and journalists, and to go and sail with the fishermen up to seven miles. Uh, and, uh, it's not, um, it's not an idea of leaving Gaza, but it's, it's that we, they want to send a message to the uh, Israeli Fashion Navy that this siege is, is illegal and we want fishermen to go up to 7 miles, even 10 miles, and 12 miles. Well, this, this is uh, reminding me of when we arrived in Gaza in 2008 with the Free Gaza mission. Uh, I actually took out the captain of the boat. Um, that went out and escorted fishermen, and we went out to the, lo the furthest distance that had happened in, I, I forget how long, it was many, many, many years, and they had the best catch ever, uh, and, and it was a great, great day for all, but I remember very well that uh, we couldn't sustain going out, and eventually I left within a month, and the people, the fishermen, are left there to deal with the Israelis, and after people stopped paying attention, they still got to risk their lives just to go out and try and, and, and get some of the fish and feed their families. With that said, Noor, I want to thank you so very much for coming on the program. It'll be an honor and a pleasure to have you on, I hope, uh, every week. And I hope even more so that the situation will improve and that we won't be talking about doom and gloom, but the liberation of the people of Palestine and the people of Gaza being able to celebrate. Because I have to say uh, all of my love and respect to the people there. Please, if you see Zainat Samouni and the Samouni family again and all the rest of the family, send them my love. Tell them I will do my very best, and I wish them all the best. Thank you so much, Noor. We'll have you on next week. Uh, inshallah, you take care. I'd like to thank Noor once again. It is really fantastic to hear from my sister in Gaza, and I look forward to future updates from Gaza from her. Now. Coming here to the people's voice, I have to say, uh, I'm sure that I'm not alone when I say that there is such a need for a station like this. It isn't just what information you'll be finding on the Middle East show, but also all of the other subjects which are completely uncovered. Uh, we had a lot of uh, information about chemtrails today, which still blows my mind that people cannot see this. Just look up. Do you trust your government? Because they're doing something up there. And yet it's not discussed at all. But one of the things that I find is really a manipulation of people is that if you have somebody who you agree with on many different levels, but there's one aspect of what they say, all of a sudden you throw the baby out with the bathwater and you immediately ignore all the good that they have to offer. Now, I use that in every sense. Now, I get great information from right-wing sources, from left-wing sources, from socialist sources. I get information from all different sources. The key to becoming aware is being able to identify information which is verifiable, that has empirical evidence behind it, intuitive understanding of information as well, and also the ability to disseminate that which can be verified, that which is valuable, and that which is rubbish. Oftentimes you'll get a lot of really fantastic information. As an example, religion. 
provides a lot of fantastic information. Now, there may be aspects of that religion that you'd be wise to go ahead and throw away, but it doesn't mean you should get rid of things like the golden rule, for instance, do unto others. Now, when I came here, it was with the understanding that I would be able to produce something that would reflect how I see the world, and in particular the Middle East. And I can assure you that what is being produced here is not David Icke's uh, information or understanding. It is my understanding. I've been given free reign to do whatever I want to the point of no libel. We have to back up everything that we say. And while the rules at Ofcom are very clear, they are violated by the mainstream media, if you ask me, left, right, and center. We know they're going to be trying to hold us to task on a level that's completely different from what they do with the mainstream media. But ultimately, we're going to stay and we're going to provide that information. And I'd like to say a personal thanks to my guest and the founder of this station, Mr. David Icke, the man himself. David, thank you so much for this fantastic job. This is truly historic. We have a station that is now broadcasting information. The mainstream puppets of propaganda, the prostitutes, as I call them, have tried to suppress, and now it's out there. And if this ain't part of changing the world for the better, I simply don't know what is. Well, Ken, I'm sitting here um, the end of the, the first week of The People's Voice, and you know, when you get close to something, you can not get blasé about it, but you, you, you're in this program, and, and then suddenly you, you're dealing with this program, and then this program. But when you sit back and just look at it, the information that's been broadcast on this station uh, from its uh, first day, across the great swathe of subjects, has been absolutely unprecedented. Uh, whether it's uh, British politics, American politics, uh, whether it's uh, the suppression of, of, of what's really possible scientifically, uh, all these different elements of 9-11 and, and climate change, they've all been dealt with in the chemtrails today. When I um, s started out all those months ago in the summer and, and I became responsible for the, 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 the content, if you like, um, the, the content we wanted to cover, um, having a focus on chemtrails on the first weekend was, was right in my mind from the start because uh, there's something, talk about in plain sight, all you've got to do is look up and, and you can see, see what's, what's happening in the sky day after day after day. But, um, you know, as we come to the end of this first uh, program uh, about the Middle East, it has fulfilled one of the biggest visions I had when, when I was looking at the content. Because uh, we see the world in a certain way because of the information we receive. It's, it's so easy to manipulate perception by manipulating the information that people receive. And nowhere is that more blatant, more obvious, and more, frankly, disgusting as it is in the Middle East and uh, particularly in relation to Gaza. And it's particularly important to me because I, um, I may look like, you know, handsome and young and virile, but <laughs> I'm actually uh, um, old enough to have been born uh, only four years after the creation of Israel. And my father, he, he was in the medical corps in the Middle East during the Second World War and became very interested in that part of the world. So I was, I was, uh, we were being, uh, looking in detail at uh, the Middle East from when I was, I was just a kid. My father was always talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, then we had the, the, uh, the conflict, if you can call it that, in 67. Um, um, I, I love it when they call it a war, when only one side um, has any chance of winning it, really. And then, and then of course, in, in the 70s came another one, and so it's gone on since. So these were widely discussed. And uh, as the years passed and the now the decades have passed, I have been beyond disgusted at the way the Palestinians have been treated, um, the way they have... Um, been subject and you know people th throw this word around so liberally that it almost loses its value mm. but in terms of the Palestinians it's absolutely applicable they have been subjected to systematic genocide and if people think that's strong well I just brought with me the official dictionary definition of genocide the systematic and widespread extermination or attempted extermination of an entire national, racial, religious, or ethnic group. And if what has happened in Palestine is not um, genocide, then genocide has no definition. You've only got to look at the progression since uh, the State of Israel was created in 1948 
of the way that uh, Palestinians have lost the land and lost more land and lost more land and lost more land. It is, it is a, a real estate confirmation, if you like, of the genocide that's going on. And then when you herd people into little more than an open-air prison, an open-air concentration camp, uh, areas of which are little more than an open-air sewer, when you, when you destroy their uh, water supplies, when you blockade um, uh, essential supplies coming into this tiny sliver of land, probably the most populated piece of land on, in the world, when you are uh, ignoring United Nations resolutions, so you're settling more and more and more of your people in occupied lands in total contempt of the United Nations and everything it's supposed to stand for, um, then what you're looking at is genocide and that, uh, that removal of the Palestinians from that area of course started with the, uh, the Israeli uh, Jewish um, uh, terrorist groups like Ergun and the Stern Gang and all these people that, that produced Prime Minister after Prime Minister after Prime Minister uh, of, of, of the Israeli state. And I, I just want to make it clear, you know, on behalf of the People's Voice, we are not anti-Israel and we are not pro-Palestinian. We are anti-injustice and we are pro-justice. We are anti-genocide uh, uh, and we're pro-bringing it to an end. It's not that we are sort of against this people and for this people. It's a simple... Uh, it's a simple case of basic humanity. Well, this, this and if it was the other way round, we'd be saying and doing the same. Well, this is it, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's like the, the schoolyard experience where the bully is beaten up on the young, weak kid. If you sit there and pretend to be neutral, as it were, in fact, what you're doing is giving license to the bully. And you only encourage the bully that much further. And this is exactly what's happened. You know, a country that's been armed to the teeth going back to 1948 you know people say you know what if, if they have no knowledge of the the so-called conflict um, they ask you know what, so what's really going on well let, let's 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 go at it this way imagine yourself and your family you've lived in a land generation after generation going back millennia as the Palestinians did um, and have uh, otherwise known as the Philistines and in 1948 on the back of a crime committed by European uh, Germans um, a settler population was shipped off into your land and of the existing population that was there they were uh, allocated about 44 percent of the land while this new population was allocated 56 percent of the land keep it in mind that the Palestinians owned over 90 percent about 93 percent land That's, so it's not difficult to understand that if you lived in a land and committed no crime against anybody else and a new population came in and they basically were given over half of the land uh, you might have a problem with it. And there's nothing, you know, that's not hard to understand. And that is exactly what it comes down to. Now, the, the insidious, nasty part of this is that it was turned into those uh, psychopathic, uh, religious fundamentalist Muslims who want to drive all the Jews into the sea. That's a lie. That's an absolute lie. And the Muslims who lived in this land lived so side by side with the Jewish people in a better way, in a more harmonious way than mostly Europeans did for century after century. So this is, it's not a difficult thing. It's actually not complicated at all. And when you really look at the Palestinian people, it is simply amazing how patient they've been. Well, everyone that I've ever met that, that spent time in, with the Palestinians has said uh, precisely that. And I think, you know, this is one of the things that, that, you know, in so many ways when I look at what's happening in Gaza, I look at a microcosm of, of the world because the same things are happening all over the world that are happening there. It's just that they're so focused and so, so extreme because it's happening to uh, people in a very small area. And, and one of the things is that if you... And you, you, you make the point, and uh, many uh, older Israelis have made this point, that before, um, I would say, the Rothschild influ um, you know, influx mm -hmm. into, into Palestine, um, Jews and, 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 and Arabs were getting on fine. It was a, was a society in which they lived together. And if you live or you look at people of different types around the world, left to their own devices, 
they'll, they'll pretty much get on most mm -hmm. of the time. But what we see is the systematic division of people playing people off against each other an encouragement not least through the manipulation of information for one group to to be at war uh, with another and you know Gilad talks eloquently about the way that when, when, when Jewish people are, are, are brought up they're, they're sold a program they're sold a belief system which he eventually of course realized wasn't true and, and, and it's a systematic division which doesn't have to be people can live together but that's not the idea because if there was peace in in, in Palestine uh, Israel if the, everyone got on then the justification for the real goal which is the genocide of the Palestinian people would not be justified and, and in in um, and uh, it's not justified in true uh, you know justification I mean justified by uh, those that are trying to sell that that uh, that policy in effect but when you look at anything like, um, like Gaza and what's happening there, I think you've, you've uh, mentioned this a few times uh, in the program, it's not just those who are doing it, it's those who are complicit with it by their silence or, and this is a, you know, coming round to the people's voice and while we're here, this is um, fundamentally why one of my visions for the content of this station was what we've seen today because it was clear to me and I said this right at the start during the appeal right at the very start <laughs> basically there's no um, you're wasting your time if you think you are going to tell the truth about Gaza by taking information and putting it through the mainstream media through mainstream politics through the UN and even and I think Gilad uh, is absolutely right you, in your discussion earlier even through so-called progressive groups because mm. it comes out the other side different to the truth my vision was and that's why it's so great to see um, uh, Noor and the horrific uh, great in the sense of getting the information out but horrific in the watching of the Samuni family I mean I found that so so moving and when you think that is just one uh, a, a tragic incident one, 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 one amazing horror uh, among endless amazing horrors in that area of the world going on and on and on year after year decade after decade it's absolutely mind-blowing but what I, why I, use, I say it, it's great is because the, the vision was to bypass everybody bypass all the censors bypass all those that put the spin on it and let those people through the people's voice speak directly to the public that's what we're about so people can hear it from the people who've suffered and not uh, uh, through some filter you know you and, and another reason that you know I'm so so passionate about doing that is because I keep hearing about terrorism in the West and it, it's it's horrific most of it like 9-11 is not what it seems of course but you see people who, who, who have suffered even in the you know state-sponsored terrorism and you you'll see the stories about them and you'll see their background all great and understandable but then you hear about drone attacks in the Middle East you hear about Israeli uh, attacks on Gaza and the people are just you know that a few people died you, you're just a statistic you're just a number you're not a human being and, and what was fantastic um, uh, about this program today is that and this is just the start we have seen um, the truth about what's happening in that part of the world today um, directly from the people who are suffering and that's the bypassing of the mainstream media that's going to allow people to see the truth of what's going on in Gaza so no longer is it just pushed aside and forgotten because now we're focusing on Syria now we're focusing on Libya now we're focusing on Il uh, Iran while this is going on all the time and massively complicit accessories in genocide of our organizations in the media like the BBC and, and many others because if you are not reporting the truth about what's going on therefore people are not aware of the truth as what's going on and therefore they don't have the ability to respond to that then you're hiding the truth that genocide is unfolding thus you are an accessory to genocide and the BBC um, 
since uh, Tony Hall, the Director General, the new one has come in, more and more massively pro-Israel people are being put into major executive positions. And the people's voice has to balance that because they'll never get the truth from the mainstream media like we've got it here today. Well, and that's, that's exactly why I have no doubt whatsoever that the powers that be are, are literally quaking in their boots. We, we have to make these connections. And, and I, I think you, people need to understand, you need to look at it one of two ways. One, other people are responsible for what's happening and otherwise uh, they uh, are the ones that have to make the decisions to change it or we take responsibility exactly. for what we do and only only when we as people take responsibility for the actions of our governments which for instance if we live in the U European Union or in America it's our governments which are doing billions and billions in trade with Israel so they can say whatever pretty words they want but at the end of the day they're giving the money over and this is the support they sell the weapons as well there's another point is uh, that I think needs to be said and I want to bring everything back to the head of the snake because this is where everyone can understand that we have the same problem. The problems the Palestinians face are our problems in the West. The first letter that was written by Lord Balfour, the Balfour Declaration, was written to Lord Rothschild. Mm -hmm. Now why do you think he wrote that letter to Lord Rothschild? Because the same people who had the power back then have the power right now. Those who control the issuance of money are basically running the world. They buy anything and everyone that can be bought and the entire system is rigged by these psychopaths at the top of the pyramid and the people of Palestine have been bearing the brunt of that because Israel in fact is nothing more than a fiefdom of the Rothschilds. It's the state of so Rothschild. the Palestinian problem is our problem. We have the same problem. This is, this is the, the big thing and, and you know this is not um, uh, uh, anti-Jewish because few people have been manipulated more than, more, than, more, than, more than Jewish people by having their perception of the situations and perception of self so manipulated. The, the Rothschilds are the people behind this stuff in Israel and behind this stuff in Gaza. And the, real, the engineers need to be exposed, not just the oil rags. And indeed, we are going to be exposing the powers that be on every level. And if we, as people, enforce and take control of our lives, we will, in fact, affect a better world. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming. This is a volunteer station. We are, our resources are very limited. I'll see you in two weeks, and hopefully we'll be on a weekly basis very soon after. Thank you so much for coming. Let's make a better world. Cheers, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, brother.